Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wellspring Family Church Online. It's great to have you uh, with us this morning, and we're really expectant to uh, see God move and know that God is moving amongst us this morning just because we're not gathered in person. we uh, It doesn't mean that uh, he's not with us because we are gathered together via social media and he is all present and uh, he is with us today. So we're really expectant to see uh, what God is going to do and uh, trust that he is going to do some uh, really encouraging stuff amongst us this morning. Uh, if this is your first time watching Wellspring Family Church live, then uh, we welcome you. We're a small local church here in Deerham and in the heart of Norfolk, and we're part of a wider family of churches called Relational Mission. My name is Marie, and I'm part of the church here in Durham, and it is so great to have you with us. Um, as many of you have probably seen and have already been typing, we've got the live chat feature, so please do engage with us on live chat. Let us know where you're watching from, if you're from uh, far and wide, or if you, perhaps if you're not connected to us, uh, pre-COVID, then um, please do get connected with us. Uh, the live chat is one way to do that. And hopefully you've seen in the PowerPoint presentation that uh, we've got uh, different ways that you can contact us, but we really do want to connect with you and get to know you if you are new to Wellspring Family Church. So um, you may have seen the sign for Alpha. I just want to encourage you, if you've been watching over the last few weeks, uh, and perhaps you've been feeling stirred, wanting to find out more about Jesus, wanting to find out more about what it means to be a Christian, maybe you've got lots of questions, then the Alpha course is a fantastic course for you to be doing. And um, we just really want to encourage you to think about doing the Alpha course. We've got another course starting soon online. Um, it's a great course. And uh, yeah, I just want to encourage you to be thinking about whether that course would be for you and, and to get in contact and, and be part of it if you've been pondering these kind of things before now. So um, we have a fairly informal style uh, as Wellspring Family Church. Uh, Sam is leading us in worship this morning. And uh, before I hand over to Sam, I'm just going to uh, pray for us uh, and then uh, I'll hand over to Sam, who is going to start by singing happy birthday to Evie this morning. So, Father God, I want to thank you that you are a good, good father. Thank you that you are here with us, that you are um, in our midst. And we, we ask, Father, right now that Holy Spirit would pour out upon each and every person watching and listening to today's service. Father, we ask that you would comfort those who need comforting, that you would convict those that need convicting, that you would strengthen those that need strengthening. Lord, let your presence be tangible to each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Sam, over to you. Thank you, Marie. So uh, it's lovely to be with you again. Love to be on your TVs. Um, I have been told that it is a very, very special birthday um, this, uh, today. Um, which is uh, it's Evie and she is seven. So what we're going to do is we're going to sing happy birthday to her. So happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Evie. Happy birthday to you. Hey. Amazing. Amazing. Right, I'd like to read some, uh, some verses from um, Isaiah 42 um, to you before we start singing. Um, so this is 42 verses 10 to 12. Um, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants, let the desert and its cities lift up their voice. Let the villages that Kedar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. This morning, we have a lot to celebrate, even more so than, um, than a birthday. We've got, um, we can celebrate that Jesus loves us. Jesus has died for us. He's rose again. He's uh, given us the gift of eternal life. 
We have a living God who's living in our hearts and he's walking in the rooms with us right now. Amen. So let's sing to him. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand had made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displays. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. My soul, my Saviour God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my saviour god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my saviour God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration. And there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Raise a clap in your homes, then shall I bow in humble adoration and then proclaim. My God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! How great Thou art, how great Thou art. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Beautiful one, I love you, beautiful one. I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. Let's sing this again. Beautiful one, I love you, beautiful one. I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. Beautiful one, I love you, beautiful one. I adore, beautiful one.
I saw my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Sing wonderful. Wonderful, so wonderful is Your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me No eye has seen, no ear has heard No heart could fully know How glorious, how beautiful you are Beautiful one, I love you Beautiful one, I adore Beautiful one, my soul Powerful, so powerful, your glory fills the skies Your mighty works displayed for all to see The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to sing How marvelous, how wonderful you are Beautiful one, I love you, beautiful one I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. Beautiful one, I love you, beautiful one. I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing, beautiful one. My soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing, beautiful one. Beautiful one, I love you, beautiful one. I adore, beautiful one, my soul. I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. You've opened my eyes to your wonders and you. You've captured my heart with this love. Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. You've opened my eyes to your wonders and you. You've captured my heart with this love. Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you Beautiful one, I love you Beautiful one, I adore Beautiful one, my soul must sing Beautiful one, I love you Beautiful one, I adore Beautiful one, my soul must sing um, <clears throat> on Thursday, um, we had a, um, an RM youth worship event called Plugged In, which um, uh, some of the youth from Deerham would have uh, um, were, were there. Um, and uh, so, as part of it, we had uh, Martin Segal from um, uh, Canterbury um, come and uh, bring a um, bring a word, um, bring a, a preach to the to the kids, and um, uh, what he was preaching on was um, uh, Revelation two, which is um, the the letters to the churches. Um, specifically, he was focusing in on the letters to the church in uh, Ephesus, um, and what what they were saying is um, uh, that the church, while looking really really great on the outside, 
um, had lost its first love, which was their love for Jesus. And um, as we were singing this, I was kind of, I was just reminded of what, what Martin was bringing, what Martin was um, kind of unpacking from the word to the youth. But it's not just something for, you know, for, for the teenagers to, to get a hold of. It's, a, it's something for all of us to get a hold of. So um, why don't you right now kind of examine your, examine your heart. What, what is it that is at the top of your priorities list? What is it that is at the top of, um, you know, at the centre of your life? And, um, you know, there's, there's subtle things which can kind of creep in to become a little bit more important you know deadlines at work you know I mean all sorts of things really um, so why don't right now you just examine yourself just just think is there is there something which may, maybe is kind of you know just creeped over Jesus in the in the list of priorities Bible describes our hearts as being um, fickle but the good news is that there's re- there's repentance and there's hope and there's always forgiveness and there's grace grace abounding in Jesus so let's um let's go through and um let's go through and sing the chorus again um beautiful one I love you and use that as a as a response as a, a kind of a you know repentance cry a heart cry to Jesus um declaring that he is um he, you want him to be the uh, the the first in your life once again, that your 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 first love. Beautiful one, I love you. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must sing. Beautiful one, I love you. Beautiful one. I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. You've opened, you've opened my eyes to your wonders anew. You've captured my heart with this love, cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. You've opened my eyes to your wonders anew. You've captured my heart with this love, Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you Beautiful one, I love you Beautiful one, I adore Beautiful one, my soul must sing Beautiful one, I love you Beautiful one, I adore Beautiful one, my soul must I'm now going to hand over to Marie to bring a word for us. I don't know if you can see this picture, but in this area here, there is a non variegated piece of plant that has grown up and it's got this really strong stalk. And as I've been looking at this plant over the week, uh, God has really been speaking to me about uh, needing to cut out any areas of our lives that are not fruitful for God, that are not filled uh, with the the fruits and the gifts of the spirit. Um, And in this plant, it's like sin or perhaps it's offence, or perhaps it's um, unforgiveness, or any of these things that we we hold on to. And the thing is, with, with this plant, because the non-variegated leaf is the dominant, um, if I don't cut that piece out, then it will eventually turn the entire plant to the non-variegated leaf. And uh, I feel that God wants to encourage us today to, and it ties in with what Sam said, that he wants us to cut out the areas of our lives that don't line up with what uh, scripture says and with what God wants for us. So I'm just going to pray for us as we, uh, we've worshipped God, we're going to continue to worship God, that he would, as Sam's just encouraged us to do, to highlight any areas in our lives that need cutting out, that need dealing with, that we need to repent from uh, so that we can live in the full 
richness of everything that God's got and the fruits of the spirit and the beauty of what our lives should look like for him will all um, be able to grow and flourish. So Father, I want to thank you that you are the almighty creator God. I want to thank you that you reign. I want to thank you that you are the God of the impossible and Jesus, that you died to set us free. You died to set us free from sin. You died to set us free to live a life that is so beautiful, to be transformed more and more into your likeness. And I ask, Father, right now that you would come and speak to each one of us about any areas that we need to cut out and that we would flourish and that we would grow and that we would look more and more like you, King Jesus, each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. I fell in love with this world when my own way trusted in me I made a plan on my own trying to hide away from the light before you created the stars you knew me by name counted my days you had a plan from the start to turn me around, winning my heart. Your love is chasing after me, your cross will bring me home. Your mercy made a way for me, your cross will bring me home. Jesus, you died for me, giving me a Forever I'll live, forever I'll sing, only for you. Jesus, you call my name, giving me life again. Forever I'll live, forever I'll sing, only for you. We turn to you again, O oh Lord. Now I'm a child of the King, righteous, restored, hidden in Him. Chosen to stand in His grace, chains all undone, abandoned in praise again. Now I'm a child of the King, righteous, restored, hidden in Him. I'm chosen to stand in His grace, chains all undone abandoned in praise your love is chasing after me your cross will bring me home your mercy made a way for me your cross will bring me home Jesus you died for me giving me everything Forever I'll live, forever I'll sing, only for you. We sing to you, Jesus, you call my name, giving me life again. Forever I'll live, forever I'll sing, only for you. Jesus, you died. Jesus, you died for me. Giving me everything Forever I'll live, forever I'll sing Only for you Jesus, you call my name Giving me life again Forever I'll live, forever I'll sing Only for you only for you Only for you Only for you We're here today only for you called. 
Jesus, you call my name, giving me life again. Forever I'll live, forever I'll sing, only for you. Jesus died on the cross he didn't just die um, for kind of like the select few he didn't just die for the people who have been you know been able to keep the laws um, you know the Pharisees um, he he died for he died for everyone he died for everyone no matter what your background no matter you know what it is that you've done whether you think that you've led a really you know a pretty good life or whether you've you know you feel like you've made a bit of a mess of it you know Jesus died for you he he died on the cross for you for me for, for everyone in this room he died on the, on the cross for everyone <laughs> For everyone in the world, all you have to do is um, is respond to that call. So I, I guess, you know, my question to you this morning would be, you know, Jesus is calling your name. What is it, what is it that you're going to say? Jesus gives us the choice to say no if you think that you know best. But the truth is you don't know best. So I'm now going to hand over to um, uh, to my dad to um, to unpack the word from uh, for us. Um, but yeah, just just hold that in your hold that in your heart. If you haven't, um, if you ha- wouldn't call yourself a Christian this morning, just let those words of that song run through your head. Um, maybe you know, crazy thought. Try asking God what it what it actually means if he's you know if he's there. And you know, my prayer for you that is that uh, that he would he would answer that for you. Great. Thanks, Sam, for uh, leading us to worship uh, again so well this week. really appreciate uh, you and others in the team that have been uh, helping us during this time. So um, please turn to um, the book of Exodus if you've got it. Uh, last week, um, if you were with us, you might remember that um, we got to this section in the story where Moses, who's been long, long in exile, uh, is now working as a shepherd. He's out in a kind of a wilderness area. And uh, he gets uh, suddenly disturbed by a fiery encounter with God. There's this extraordinary sight of a, uh, an unconsumed yet burning bush. And he's drawn aside to come and investigate what's going on. And uh, as the words of that song are picked out, God calls Moses by name. And in this encounter with God... God is beginning to reveal himself to Moses. Now, um, looking at the story of Exodus, it feels like when you read it that there's been a great silence in the first two chapters before we get to chapter three. It's as if God has not been speaking. Yet, as we've noted over a number of weeks, even though it looks like we we can't see God, we can't hear him, uh, we're wondering what on earth is going on, as the readers of the story, we actually realise that God is incredibly active in working through his plans and purposes. But now, in this moment, God begins to speak. It goes from silence to uh, dramatic speaking. It feels like, in those first couple of chapters of Exodus, that uh, the descendants of Abraham living in Moses' generation, it's as if they're, they scarcely know God they, uh, th- th- there's no intimacy, there's no communication. It feels like there's no relationship. There's a real question mark, really, over whether they know God hardly at all. But Moses, in this encounter, is going to get to know God in such a way that he's going to be able to go back to those people and he's going to be able to speak in a personal way about this God and to let uh, the people know who, about who this God is. So Moses... <coughs> we heard in the uh, the chapter last week, uh, now is being given a mission. But in these two chapters, three and four, there's a, an unexpected hurdle for Moses to overcome. And the hurdle actually is Moses himself. You remember from 
the first chapter or first two chapters, Moses the prince, Moses the freedom fighter, Moses the justice campaigner, Moses the guy who takes a lead, who takes action. The young, impulsive, instinctive Moses has almost vanished from sight. No wonder, given 40 years of exile, 40 years to reflect on his failure, 40 years to reflect on a lack of accomplishing anything, 40 years of having been driven out. And so when God speaks, the very first thing that happens in chapter 3, verse 6, by the way, we are getting to chapter 4 in just a moment. Uh, So Marie, get ready. But in in chapter 3, verse 6, what does Moses do when God speaks? He instinctively hides. He was afraid of God. And there's much more that we could maybe say about that. But you might remember back in Genesis that when Adam and Eve hear the voice of God, their instinct is to hide. Uh, the, the sin in the lives of us as human beings puts a, uh, a barrier between us and God, a sense of shame, a sense of guilt, a sense of responsibility, a, a fear that when we come up against the holiness of God, our lack of holiness is going to lead to a disaster, death. So probably wisely he hides. But then as God <clears throat> continues to speak to him, verses 11 and 12, his response to God saying, I've got a job for you to do, Moses, is to say, well, who am I? Me? How could I do this? It seems that uh, his identity has become wrapped up in his failure. And so he's disqualifying himself from being able to do it. And we're not going to get into it particularly today, but it, it, it's just a reminder that if we are going to live for God and serve him, it's utterly key that we know our identity in Jesus Christ, not in what we've done, our successes or our failures, not our background, our, whether we brought up in the court or whether we were brought up in the bulrushes. Uh, all of this is not relevant. To the, it's our identity in Jesus Christ, which is of fundamental importance. But then in verse 13 of chapter 3, so after the first objection, which is, who am I? I couldn't do this. The next objection is basically, well, what am I going to say? I mean, I don't even know who's sending me. What, I don't know. What, what am I going to say? I couldn't go and speak to the people. I don't even know who you are, God. And so if we're going to know our identity, it's pretty clear that the starting point is actually getting to know who God is. <laughs> you know, Searching for your identity in this world apart from God is a futile exercise. It's a chasing after the wind and look how fast it's blowing today you'll never catch up with it you can't find your own identity you need God to reveal it to you and you will discover your identity as you discover God and so Moses needs to know who God is anyway we're going to pick up on the story we're midway through this conversation and we're in chapter 4 and verse 1 and uh, here we go let's follow it through together Exodus 4 verses 1 to 17 Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, It's a star. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground. And it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Again the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, Put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. When he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, then they may believe the latter sign. If they do not believe even these two signs and will not listen to your voice, then you should take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water you take from the Nile shall become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, 
and I will be and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, O oh Lord, please send somebody else. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you will be as God to him. And take up this staff with which you will do the signs. Oh, <laughs> not sure why Anna Goodman appeared at the end there. Fantastic. That's really great. Thank you so much uh, to the young people. I, I fear it was very distracting seeing their faces, and you might not have been paying attention. But anyway, here we go. So... <clears throat> <coughs> it's interesting to see then what's happened to Moses. Moses of uh, 40 years previous, our very confident prince in Egypt, has now really taken on board a, a characteristic of what we might describe as meekness. In, in Numbers 12 and verse 3, Moses is described as the meekest man. And uh, uh, it seems as though God has, over the 80 years of his life, been working very patiently uh, it was interesting as Marie was sharing uh, that picture earlier about the plant. There's a time when God prunes that's sudden, but there's a time when God is patient and he allows something to grow to see what's going to happen. But God works in both those two ways. Sometimes he will allow something to grow until you can begin to see it. I, I was re realizing this the other week. I was looking at, looking at a, a weed that was about two feet high in my garden. I didn't know it was a weed, but now I could see actually what it was beginning to manifest itself as out it came and so in the same way God will sometimes be very patient and then sometimes God will act very very fast Moses has been worked on by God then for all these years uh, in silence and now in verse 1 he of chapter 4 he offers his, his his third objection which is this well they won't believe me and of course, this is a pretty reasonable um, concern he's raising because actually when he uh, went and spoke to his people before, they said, who are you to speak to us? Uh, they rejected him before. And then that rejection seems to have gone into his heart. He feels that rejection. It's not gone away from all those years, 40 years. He's been nursing a rejection in his heart. And then he says in verse 10, his, his uh, next objection, number four, he says, well, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak well. Hmm, interesting. Moses, the man who was brought up in the court, trained, no doubt, in speech making and eloquence. And yet the man who, when he spoke to his own people, they wouldn't listen. Uh, he's wisely lost confidence in his own ability to speak on his own behalf. The co his courtly way, his natural bearing, his inherent authority, it, it failed him once before. And he's lost confidence in it. Perhaps we've had a go at doing something in the past. And uh, if we failed. And we've now lost confidence. And then in verse 13. Oh my goodness. Uh, Moses reaches the final straw in this conversation with God. Please send someone else. My goodness. That's pretty bold, isn't it? Speaking to God in that way. It's one thing saying, I can't do it. And then finally saying, God, you send someone else. Wow. But what's interesting in this story, please note this, is that God is not hindered by any of our weaknesses. God will work through us. He's almighty God. But notice this also, that that doesn't mean he's not also burning with holiness. Do you remember when Moses first encounters the bush? It shoes off. He, he's going to have to accept the fact that when you're dealing with a holy God, you have to do what a holy God says. God is not looking for our abilities and gifts, our natural capabilities to be able to get things done. God's looking for one thing, really, which is our obedience. When he speaks, we do what he says. And in verse 14, we see the evidence of this as God now begins to kind of reveal how he feels about Moses' disobedience. God is looking for our obedience. <clears throat> so how does all of this relate to us? Well, pretty obviously, I guess. God is looking for meekness. Uh, just reflect on your own life 
for a moment or two. Is meekness and humility a characteristic of the way that you act, the way that you communicate? Do you deal with people in a way that they feel like you've been gentle with them? Do they feel bigger and better about themselves when they finish speaking to you? Or do they feel smaller and demeaned in some way? Moses had a meekness about him, which that verse in Numbers 12, verse 3 picks up on. Friends, it's the most beautiful characteristic. <clears throat> in my, albeit limited, experience, all the great Christian leaders that I've got to know a little bit in my lifetime, all manifested. It's a hallmark of true leadership. Long for it. Cultivate it. It's not a, something you can get by a snip. It's something that grows over time by actively seeking it, by humbling yourself under God's mighty hand. Meekness will come in time. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I don't need to assert. I don't need to push. I don't need to force. I don't need to manipulate to make it happen. I don't have to get one over other people. I'll back down, indeed, that God might raise me up in due course. That's where meekness comes, from a, a, a cultivation of that attitude. But watch out. There is false meekness. And false meekness is an excuse for disobedience. You see, the meek are also obedient to the voice of God. There's a fine line here. You know, oh, I could never do that, can become a disobedience to what God's calling us to do. Now, probably each of us is tempted to fall one way or the other over those two lines. Are you obeying God at the moment? I wonder, is there any area of your life at the moment where God is calling you to do something which perhaps because of past failures, because of past rejections, because of difficulties that you faced, you're saying, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. And you're hiding behind a humility and a meekness, which is false. Because if God says it, you need to do it. The brash push themselves forward. The meek are free of self-assertion, but they are confident in God's call and promise to them. Now, Moses' self-confidence has been dealt with, I think. His confidence will be in God, not in himself. But now there is a sharp pruning moment that's coming about obedience. Now, like Moses, and by the grace of God, we also have been commissioned by the Lord Jesus. Hear your own voice in Moses' mouth here. People won't listen to me if I tell them about Jesus. I don't know what to say. Lord, send someone else. Can't someone else do it? But Jesus is Lord and he has commissioned us and he's promised his presence to go with us as we go in obedience. God's a God of grace. Of course, he knows our weaknesses. He accepts us as we are by the grace of God, but he is still God. And we would be wise when we hear his commission to obey by faith even though we can't do it in Christ we shall do it that's the way it works Moses couldn't lead the people out of Israel he couldn't speak he couldn't do all these things but in the power of God nevertheless all these things will be accomplished so two things going on here in his exile Moses has over a long period of time learnt humility He's become meek. But now Moses is undergoing rapid preparation for the start of the mission. There's a pruning going on alongside that long-term process. Let's just look quickly at some of the ways that God specifically is preparing him. First of all, he's going to prepare him with three signs. There's the staff. I love the way that Evie managed her staff. Uh, the staff stroke serpent. Secondly, there's the leprosy stroke cleansing of the leprosy. In fact, it probably wasn't leprosy, but some kind of skin disease anyway. And then there's the water blood. So first of all, let's talk about the staff. The staff is prominent in the whole story, in fact. The staff is a sign of the authority that God has given to Moses. Moses' authority doesn't come from himself. It comes from God. The staff is a symbol of what God has given him to do. Now, when God tells him to throw the staff down, it turns into a snake. What does he do next? He runs. To be honest, if you see a snake in front of you, it's probably a good idea to run away. Okay, 
That would be the right thing to do. If God says, pick the snake up by the tail, I guess that's what you've got to do. But let's be honest. The one thing you shouldn't really ever do, children, please listen, don't pick up snakes by their tail. It's not a good idea. Their heads are free to bite. Now, there's a symbolism in this because the pharaohs had the hood the hood of the cobra as part of their kind of headgear thing that the serpent is the pharaoh there's a symbolism moses is going to do the most dangerous thing he's going to go back to the pharaoh who was after his life admittedly there's a perhaps we're going to find there's the next generation of pharaoh but the the death, sent, death sentence is over him to go and stir up the snake to seize it by its tail is a dangerous thing to do you don't do that Children, don't pick up snakes unless they're plastic. But if God tells you to do something, even when it seems hazardous, then that's what we do. Moses is learning here. When God speaks, you obey in detail. God didn't say pick it up by the head. He said pick it up by the tail. So he does exactly what God says. Notice what happens as Moses encounters the snake. As his hand goes to it, what happens? There is a hardening of the snake. What is going to happen if you know the story to Pharaoh as, as Moses encounters him? His heart is going to get hardened. There is a, like a, a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the story. There's going to be a hardening, but it's going to be a hardening which ultimately will lead to not failure, but to success, of course. So that's the first thing, the staff serpent thing. Secondly, we've got the leprous skin. Moses is going to have to learn that though his past failures, in a sense, disqualify him. As he puts his hand on his heart and God deals with him miraculously, he's cleansed. God cleanses Moses of his past. In a moment, in an instant, he's washed clean. Nothing from his past can hold him back. Thirdly, water turned to blood. It's a symbol, really, of the overcoming of the power of the enemy. It's a, it's a really obvious prefiguring of the plagues that are about to come. Now, these signs are there to reassure Moses, so he's to know that God's with him in power, but they're also going to be to confirm to the Hebrews, to God's people, that God has definitely sent Moses. In the same way, the signs that Jesus would later perform, much greater signs, would confirm to us as the, the people who hear the eyewitness accounts that Jesus is Lord, undoubtedly so. Now, <clears throat> When Moses does his whole, I can't speak, please send someone else, all that kind of trick, God uh, does seem to accommodate his request. And so uh, M Moses is sent Aaron, his brother, of course. And do you notice in the text that it's underlined that Aaron is a Levite? Um, perhaps uh, we, we might just need to be aware of uh, verses 27 to 28, slightly further than where we uh, actually read earlier. So, God uh, is gracious to Moses. He puts him in a context of team. He's not on his own. He's complimented. He's going to go in a pair. Um, and uh, we can see how God so often calls us to work in those same ways as well. Although it's interesting that although Moses says, I can't speak, pretty much from here on he does all the speaking. And Aaron is just there to back him up and to support him. Now look, I just want to read to you verses 18 to 20. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and they went back to the land of Egypt and Moses took the staff of God in his hands. So I don't know, it's just a, it's a brief little snippet of a, an encounter here. But do you see how Moses leaves well? He, he uh, goes back to Jethro. Uh, he treats him honorably. He, he makes sure there's peace and blessing in the parting. Just a very quick thing, comment to make, really. Whenever we move on in life, it's really important that we leave well. It's easy to get that wrong. Honor those historic relationships. Uh, whether that's in the workplace, if you're moving to a new job or retiring, whether it's in church, if God's moving on, maybe moving to a new place or whatever's going on, or in all kinds of human relationships, leaving well is difficult to do. So do it prayerfully. Honour people as you move on because there can be a pain and a hurt 
when we do move on. So leave in peace with blessing. Now, verse 24, uh, it says, uh, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him. Okay, so God's meeting Moses again. We're about to read something really, that seems really weird here, okay? And so God, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. What? Then Zipporah took, that's his wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. He is God. He let him alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, this is a very strange story. And you probably think, what on earth? But let's just uh, try and hopefully simply explain what's going on here. We don't know why, but for some reason, though Moses has had a son, and Moses is a descendant of, of Abraham, and an inheritor of the covenant promise. Remember, covenant means a special promise in this case, between God and a people, for some weird reason, Moses had not circumcised his son. This was the most important command that God gave to Abraham and for all of Abraham's descendants. It was the, the way of Abraham and his descendants saying, we are totally connected to and dependent on the promise of God to bless us and to be his people. And for reasons that we don't know why, Moses hadn't bothered to do it. And God has called Moses on a mission, but Moses is plowing on without having properly sorted out all of the issues, things undone from his past. He's neglected this issue. It's like he's going, but he's going without dependency on God. He's, he's going in his own strength. He, he must know that the only hope for him and his people is the promise of God that was given to Abraham for all generations. Anything else would be a disaster. And God confronts Moses. Moses is trying to do this in a totally separate way from the way of God. It seems weird to us because we don't understand how important it is to know that God always deals with his people on the basis of his promises. You can't deal with God in a different way other than the way that God has shown and according to his promises. So he's on the way to serve God, but God stops him. It's incredibly dangerous. Now, it, it's a, a very bizarre story to us. But notice even in this a foreshadowing of the Passover. The story, they're in a lodging house. It's night time. They're in a house. It, it, there's blood shed, which has to be spread around. Death passes near, but passes over. Moses is learning, you must do what God says. Friends, God has a way of interrupting our path, stopping us dead, if you'll accept the pun, uh, in order to speak to us and to deal with issues that we've been avoiding maybe for years. God's holy and merciful, but by grace, sometimes uh, he will confront us because there's a moment of pruning that is required. He does it because he loves us, not because he's against us. It's because he's for us. It might not be comfortable when God deals with us in these ways, but it is kind. As I've said repeatedly, sometimes God deals with us over a long period. Sometimes God deals with us in the moment. He's God. This is how prophet Hosea put it. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He struck us down and he will bind us up. Sometimes God reveals himself in a burning bush. Sometimes it's in a painful and sudden crisis. But God is preparing Moses. And the last thing, verses uh, 21 to, to 23. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles I've put in your power, but... I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, listen to this, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill 
your firstborn son. Now God has already told Moses that Pharaoh is going to say no. But the, the saying no that Pharaoh is going to do is going to create an opportunity for God to reveal more about himself and his glory. But in the meantime, God is now preparing Moses so he knows exactly what to say when the setback comes. God is preparing him to deal with the setback. And embedded within the preparation is just the most phenomenal piece of truth that I want to highlight for a moment. Did you notice that God warns Pharaoh of the consequence of resisting God's will? And in the process, he calls Israel his firstborn son. In other words, God looks at Israel and he views Israel as if as a nation, collectively, they are God's son. It's like in the whole story of the Exodus, we're going to come back to this in a bit, but it's like a birth is taking place. As they go through the waters and come out the other side, it's like they're going to be born again as a, as a nation and as a son. Moses represents the nation as one man. We've seen that over the last few weeks. What happens to Moses is like a foreshadowing of what's going to happen to the nation. Now the nation before God is one, one son. And there is a new revelation contained in this, that God is their father. This is the first reference in the whole of the Bible to the fatherhood of God. Now, as Christians reading this, we read it in the light of Christ. And of course, we come to understand that Jesus is the Son of God, with a capital S if you like. He's the true Son, the perfect Son, the true Israel. Moses will fail. Israel will fail. Their, their, their sonship, it will collapse uh, due to their human frailty and weakness. They won't obey the Father in all things. We're already seeing that. Moses hasn't got started yet and he's already messed up. Jesus, by contrast, is the Son that will obey to the uttermost. Through his obedience and by faith, we will then be adopted into relationship with the Father. Now in the Old Testament, the nation relates to God as Father. But then when Jesus comes... The, the new covenant that Jesus establishes through the shedding of his blood. He says to you and me, when you pray, pray like this, our father. He says, call God your father. And through the, through the, uh, the, the New Testament, there are repeated uh, encouragements to the disciples to call God father. This is something foreign to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the sonship of the nation and the fatherhood of God was sort of distant and limited. But then in Christ, as this new thing happens, this new covenant, this new revelation, there is a new relationship of sonship that we all can enjoy. We're all adopted individually and corporately into God's family. And we can pray, our Father, Father God, we can sing. And this becomes a mega theme in the New Testament. Sam's going to come back to us uh, and we're going to sing a song. Uh, please don't uh, leave at the end of the song because I'm just going to lead us in a short time of prayer as we respond to all of this uh, in a few moments. So let me um, hand over to Sam and uh, we'll then come back together to pray in just a few moments. Sam. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you worthy of 
worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Sing Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show and fill me with your heart and leave me in your love to those around me I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will There is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and leave me in your love to those around me. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and leave me in your love to those around me show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me okay i'm just going to ask you to join me to pray uh, I hope um, it's quiet in your house at the moment. Still your heart before the Lord. Holy Spirit, there's no limitations. You can meet us in the lodging house. You can meet us in the burning bush. You can meet us in the wilderness. You can certainly meet us in the, in the living room or wherever we're placed right now. Come Holy Spirit. Do what only you can do, I pray. Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask you now that you would reveal to our hearts and minds any issue that you want to confront to prune in this moment. We trust you to lead us, Lord. We don't need to go digging around looking for things to accuse ourselves with. Right now, Holy Spirit, speak into our minds. Maybe there's a, a memory that will rise of uh, something that maybe a parent may have said when you were much, much younger. So often, perhaps more often than anything else, we find that it's in the area of forgiveness or unforgiveness that the blockages come, the, the roots come. 
what Hebrews calls a root of bitterness. It stops us knowing God's grace. I wonder if there is a wound. Maybe it's an old wound from decades past. Or maybe it's a new wound from this very week. You haven't forgiven yet. Maybe you say, I can't. Well, Moses could go no further until he did what God said. Jesus says we must forgive. So in your heart right now, I want you to make that choice that you're going to forgive. You're going to forgive that man or woman for what they said or did to you, that group for what they said about you. Holy Spirit, minister to our hearts right now, I pray. Give us the courage that we need to respond. Now in Jesus' name, we say, Lord, I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive family members. I choose to forgive work colleagues. I choose to forgive teachers. I choose to forgive men or women. I choose to forgive when people have said things which were too painful, I I couldn't hear it. I choose to forgive when they got the timing wrong, even though what they said was right. I choose to forgive when someone got it completely wrong. I choose to forgive, Lord Jesus. I can't go forward carrying unforgiveness in my heart. Meet with me right now. Give me the strength I need. I choose to obey. Therefore, I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive without reservation. We forgive those who trespass against us. Unconditionally. Unilaterally. I forgive even those maybe who are dead and buried. I can't speak to them, but I speak to you, O Lord. I release forgiveness now. Maybe even tears need to come where you are in your room. That's okay. Now, Lord Jesus, in the story, Moses uh, had blood spread on him even. The blood of Jesus cleanses us. I pray for the blood of Jesus, the the finished work of Jesus on the cross to cleanse and heal, to save and deliver us in this area of our lives, Lord. Wherever we need your healing now, heal our hearts. Lord, like Moses putting his hand, as it were, on his heart and then the hand came out and the leprosy, the filth, the uncleanness was gone. Lord, won't you do that? Won't you deliver us in an instant? Forgive us and heal us, O God, wherever we need that. In Jesus' name we pray. Heal us, O God. Lord, we build our lives on you, on your word. We obey what you say. Just perhaps sing the chorus through again, Sam. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and leave me in your love to those around me i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.
Oh, Father God, we thank you that you've been with us today. We thank you, Jesus, that you died to set us free, that we can be free from all of these things. And so, Father, we ask for your blessing upon each and every one of us this week as we go uh, about our daily lives. Will you help us to glorify you, Lord Jesus? Will you clear away any dross that still remains in our lives, Lord, that we would um, be able to really point people to you and live and walk in the freedom that you have won for us on that cross. Amen. If you uh, want to speak to uh, anyone from the church about what's been raised today, if, if God's spoken to you and raised some issues that you need uh, to talk through, then please do get in contact with us. We would love to um, talk you through those things and uh, yeah, help you to deal with some of those things that God maybe have raised today. So uh, be blessed. I'm going to draw an end to the meeting now and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. God bless.